This is Zmira Lutsky at the radio studios in Jerusalem. And our guest of honor here tonight is composer Joseph Tal. Good evening, Mr. Tal. Good evening. Maestro, you are a witness. A witness to most of the music-making processes of our century. Is writing a symphony at the close of the 20th century different from what you have done till now? Oh, of course. Uh, if I write, I'm not aware of the date. I'm just uh, following my life. Yes, but you are aware of things that happened within yourself. Oh, yes, yes, I have to, of course. I mean, uh, all my uh, the education I got, and the experience I got, and, you know, in this century, uh, you passed... You passed, in fact, uh, quite a number of different epochs, especially in music. Because of this, um, I see quite unique evolution in the music language, which is uh, difficult to compare with any other century. Of course, also because of the, um, because of the technological development which um, change communication so often and and therefore you in one life you can pass very very different things before you really established a certain epoch then it's already over and you have to enter new ideas um, and this is a very important point because neither the atonal music nor the dodecaphonic music, the twelve-tone music, nor the aleatoric music, n none of those, let's say, systems or ideas came to a full development, different from the tonal music, which uh, some hundred years uh, went on and established Um, common language. So how do you reconcile the symphonic structure with all its connotations and associations with the modern techniques? Well, uh, first of all, the name symphony, uh, as you said, uh, has a lot of, uh, or rather a lot of associations, but this symphony is just in the meaning of the word. It is symphonos, many voices mm. come together. There's no, n no association to a classical form of symphony, not at all. And if you ask me what form it has, there is, for the time being, no terminology what kind of symphony that is. So um, uh, the form comes with the process of composing. Uh, what, what you are doing while composing, you build up the form. This is, um, I, I once have been asked um, where the theme is, the subject of the symphony. So I answered, and I think rightly, the theme is the symphony himself. Because I am starting from the most uh, uh, fundamental part of the idea, which is a very, very small little item of sound, and from this sound comes out the whole work. It is as when you see a mighty tree in the forest, so where from does it come, really? To see where from does it come, you need certainly a microscope. And there is something similar, because it is a process of nature. Not that this symphony uh, base is based on a kind of a nature program. Far from it. Far from it. It goes far away from nature. But of course the material is the sound. But would you say, does it have any connection to something Cosmic? You say not nature? Certainly, certainly. Yes. Cosmic, but in the, in the sense of nature. 
not in the sense of mystic, not in the sense of trying to paint something uh, full of um, universal fantasy, things like that. I mean, it is not the kind of graphic you use today in television programs, which is uh, artificial painting um, and very much influenced by the nature of the relevant computer. But apropos computers, won't you say that the symphony is like a scanner of your inner thoughts, inner musical life? Any composition is, in a way, a scanner of my inner life. And, and uh, that's not my speciality for every composer. Yes, but at, in the, at our century, we sort of needed a very special listener to understand and to make full use of the scanning abilities. This is right, uh, but uh, this was the case in all centuries. I mean, don't, don't think that uh, Beethoven's symphony was easy to grasp for a common listener in his time. Yes, we know that uh, we have documents of this. The first symphony was a big, in fact, in the critics of the uh, then one of the leading uh, musical papers, that was the Leipziger Allgemeine Musikzeitung, the critic uh, said, well, um, a symphony in C major and the composer starts in F major. Well, there's one of the, the he's known for these things and he wants to be modern in any case and for any any reason you know, this kind of uh, relating to a new work is nothing else but the uncertainty, because there are new things. Every new thing is, uh, you, you have to go into the thing till you can really evaluate the, um, the content of the new thing you uh, formulate. And, of course, the listener is far from it, and he needs his time till he gets used to it. So a composer should never be in a hurry. Should never be intimidated should by the Should never be intimidated, no, listener. by no means. He is, in a way, of course. He is also a human being. That's true. So, um, but we, we've uh, witnessed in the 20th century a big, let us say, rift, a big chasm between the composer and the audience and yes, its audience and the yes. listeners. Yeah, this is not new either. No. No, but it's very extreme today, mainly because there are so many listeners, never have been such a large public. So how do you come across this chasm? How do you make this contact with your well, listener, uh, with your fellow, fellow listeners? Yes, I understand mother. what you say. Yes, you are absolutely right, and that's a very important question today. Uh, uh, first of all, as a composer, you shouldn't be killed by um, um, you shouldn't be killed by the fact that the public is frightened by new music. It doesn't want to hear those things. Aggressively frightened. Aggressively, even, yeah. even aggressively frightened. Yes, a composer must take it if he is serious, if he really wants to give a message, which is not the common message, a little different formulated, and that's all. But it's always the same content, more or less, of something which, meantime, during the centuries, has become a conventional way of speaking. But he wants to say something really new. And this happened with Mozart quite often. And we forgot that today. Um, well, if this is the case, then the composer must be modest in the sense that he has to expect that. I know for myself, I don't compare myself as Mozart, of course, but I know from my own experience, if I have an immediate success when some new work is played, success with the public, Yes, the, the approach is really bravoureuse. If that happens, I'm very skeptical with myself. Why? The, in, in the first moments. 
in the first moments, because I'm used to it that the uh, public says, uh, perhaps politely, yes, it's very interesting. And uh, this means, um, well, I don't dare to say it's uh, pure nonsense, or I, I, it's awful, it sounds terrible, and all these things. This is behind the very interesting. It wants to say, in any case, it's not beautiful, but it's interesting. So it brings over the whole thing to the, to the field of thinking and separate it from the field of feeling. If I say, or if somebody of the public says, oh, it's beautiful music, I am the same way skeptical because I don't know what he means by beautiful. You see, these are things the composer has to take. He has to stick to his work, to his ideas, whether they are immediately successful or not. And there is no way out of it. What is your credo? Pardon? My credo? Yes. <laughs> my credo is to remain myself. I, I remember well when I played my first piano concerto with electronic music. That was in Tel Aviv for some festival. Uh, and this was very unused, you know, something out of the heaven, and, and uh, public at large, they didn't know what to do with it. Although, I remember that after this concert, people started to rush towards the stage and to look what happened there, because they heard fantastic things, but there was no orchestra on the stage. I myself, that's all, was a grand piano. But the grand piano, they know, can't make this kind of noises. And they, they, they ex uh, accepted this as pure noises, not as music, not as sounds, not as tones, nothing musical, noises. You see, well, OK. But the next day, the papers, with the critics, I remember one of the daily papers, there was a very large uh, um, public behind. On the first page, very unusual that the music critic is on the first page. On the first page, in block letters, thick, large block letters, was written, terror. You see? Yes. Uh, well, uh, I mean, not that I laughed, but I could understand. I could understand. And um, I remember that I played that at this time from the notation I, I made. A notation I myself uh, constructed, so to say, because at this time many technical faults happening, even during the performance, so that I shouldn't be, I should always be on the right time, on the right place. And so I wanted to be sure. Also, I knew that by heart, but I wanted to be sure. And I remember that the Japanese ambassador was sitting in the first row, and he took binoculars to follow my score. Uh, you see, these are things which happen with new, entirely new things that wouldn't happen today. And nobody would say today that this kind of piece is terror. They would listen to it, because you can already hear quite similar things in orchestral music because they influence each other. And would you care to describe the ideal listener? The ideal listener? Yes. Yes. How would you like him to be? Yes. Um, the idea, the, the listener is a human being like the composer himself. There's no difference. They learned different ways, of course. They specialized different ways, but they are all human beings. Um, the composer thinks and feels. The listener has to do the same. If he is busy to uh, find out what style is it, if he is busy to find out if there are already similar melodies by Brahms, so there's nothing new, that's an old-fashioned man. If he is busy not with the music as such, but with all kind of comparisons, in order to be sure he got for his ticket a new original work of great value. 
that's very difficult. If it is new, really, so he has to take his time and to listen to it as to all the other things. He didn't learn in school his different subjects, his physics, his mathematics, his languages. He didn't learn that in one hour. He learned that for years, step by step. But here in the concert, he wants to have it immediately. As his own property, he got it. Well, such a listener, that's, that's just impossible. I know for myself, if I hear, if I listen to a new work, I take my time to go into it. It will be quicker. That might be because uh, I'm more used to it. Okay. But in principle, I have also to learn it. And I have to learn it the right way. In music, it's not enough only to learn it uh, uh, intellectually. I also to have to, to free myself, to let me go, and to go into something which we call feeling, which nobody knows what that is. Yes, because we can't analyze it, so we have common words for it, which doesn't say anything be, uh, besides that I don't know what it is. So I feel. That means I am activated, activated emotionally through my intellect, what I got, because the um, information is, first of all, intellectual. <clears throat> and then I find out what did he say, and that might activate myself. Positive, positively or negatively, doesn't matter. But if I am not activated at all, then this is very sad for the composer. I have nothing against the listener who says, that's awful music, don't go to this pen. Go, don't go to that. I can understand that, absolutely. I wouldn't say a word. And if the listener says, well, it's interesting, but I want to hear it again. I am very happy. I am the heaven. And if he wants to know more even, okay, I can talk with you about it. With pleasure, I can talk from my own experiences. I think today this is very important. This is what we call listening to music as a, a subject in music education. This usually is very badly done. Very bad, because it doesn't come from a composer, it comes from a so-called scientist. Yes. The music and science, the, if you use both words in one, as one word, as the Germans say, Musikwissenschaft, well, that's a very questionable thing, very questionable thing. What is in music really scientific? And what is something else very different from science? You see, these are the problems of our day. And let's say if I, am, if I would be privileged to live another 150 years, well, then our interview right here would be certainly quite different. Thank you very much, Mr. Tal. We wish you a lot of active listeners, and we wish your Fifth Symphony, as, as well as your other works, a successful and communicative and safe passage into the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you. The works will be very happy if it will be so. Thank you. And thank you, our listeners, wherever you are.